Um, so I'll be talking about uh, long run and intergenerational effects of uh, child health investments. And as I'll point out in a couple of slides, this is joint work with lots of folks, some of whom are in the room. Um, and I, I'll definitely point that out. Um, so a question that motivates this work and some of, of the other work I've been doing recently is uh, trying to understand how economic status is transmitted uh, over time through the generations and what we can do to boost intergenerational mobility, really give people uh, a chance to, to improve their living standards and improve their children's living standards. This is obviously a very important scholarly issue, policy issue, but the evidence has been limited, especially in low and middle income countries. There's been kind of more evidence on this in recent years using large admin data sets in rich countries, um, but less so in LMICs. So there's a bunch of reasons why one has to do with limited uh, you know, data availability of the kind that's used in rich countries. Um, in uh, poor countries where, where there isn't usually the kind of registry data or admin data that's available, we would need to rely on other data sources, but there's very few long-term uh, longitudinal data sets in uh, poor countries, especially that span generations. There's just like a handful that we can, we can point to. Um, and then you know, a, a fundamental issue in understanding um, policy impacts or causal effects in general is getting uh, the kind of variation that we can interpret as causal. So either randomized variation or some other exogenous variation that we think we can interpret, you know, confidently uh, interpret causally uh, in a world of many confounders. So there's a lot of limitations and it's been a hard, uh, hard thing to make progress on, but there has been sort of a path forward over the last couple decades um, and two changes in particular have made the work uh, we're doing today, I'll talk about today possible. One is there's been a huge increase in randomized controlled trials in development economics in the last couple of decades. These were really unknown in the social sciences. Obviously, trials were common in medicine uh, before and in agriculture and some other fields, but they become much more common in, in the social sciences um, and especially development economics. And so the availability of, of a lot of trials, you know, uh, means there's a lot of random variation or exogenous variation we can exploit and study. Uh, the other one is there's just been really amazing data efforts, long-term, multi-decadal, intergenerational data efforts in low and middle-income countries. I, I cite the Indonesia Family Life Survey here, but there's others. And the number of these surveys has really increased in the last couple decades. So. Uh, we've you know, learned how to measure living standards better in poor countries, learned how to follow people over time. And that combination of the rise of RCTs and better and better long-term longitudinal data in poor countries is really what enables uh, the work today. So today I'm gonna to be talking about the long run effects and intergenerational effects um, of a, a health investment using 23 years of longitudinal data from the Kenya Life Panel Survey. So this is a data collection effort that I started uh, shortly after I got to Berkeley, basically the year I got to Berkeley or the year afterwards. Um, many people in the room here are collaborating on different aspects of that, uh, of that project. And then the payoff from you know, decades of effort is now we can start looking at long run effects. So on, on some level, this is the hardest paper uh, I've ever had to work on. If you just look at the, the hours of time and money and effort over a long period of time to collect the data, but then some of the analysis is gonna be like pretty simple. Um, and so that's just kind of maybe the nature of some of this long-term uh, work. If you collect the right data, maybe then like pretty simple analysis can shed light on things. That's the hope at least. Um, so this is based on a lot of published work and I'm gonna to touch on a, a bunch of different papers. Josh alluded to kind of this older work with Michael uh, Kramer uh, on the deworming experiment that I'm gonna talk about today. One of the first RCTs in development economics uh, that was cited in Kramer's Nobel um, announcement. And then a series of other papers in both econ journals and scientific journals. And then, you know, half the talk is gonna be on this last uh, paper, which is new and we've just submitted uh, on um, intergenerational child mortality impacts. And then in terms of folks who are in the room, Michael Walker, the first author really took the lead on a lot of the, the work is here. Um, I don't know if Matt, I don't know if Matt Krupoff is here, but another, uh, you know, co-author uh, was here earlier today, and then, you know, a bunch of folks, um, some of our Kenyan colleagues like Eric Chang and others uh, as well. Uh, all right, so let me just start with uh, the kind of health problem that, that motivated our work um, starting a couple decades ago now, which were intestinal worm infections. 
Uh, intestinal parasites are widespread in low and middle income countries. They're not as big a public health issue today as they were a few decades ago, thankfully. And I'll talk about uh, some of the reasons why, uh, but still large shares of uh, people around the world are infected with intestinal worms. They can lead to a range of nutritional and health uh, consequences. They can affect kids' development. Um, and then beyond the direct nutritional consequences, there's some evidence that they affect the gut microbiome, which isn't crazy when you think about the fact that they live in your intestines. They can affect uh, the immune system and how well people can fight off other infectious diseases. So, you know, a whole range of health consequences. The worm infections that were prevalent in the part of Western Kenya where we worked at the time uh, were hookworm, roundworm, whipworm, and schistosomiasis. So a range of different um, helminths. And, you know, they're really transmitted through infected fecal matter. So settings with uh, inadequate sanitation and hygiene tend to have high rates of worm infections. Um, and, you know, over time, as those conditions improve, worm infections fall. Um, one of the only good things about worms is they have a limited lifespan. They only live a couple of years on average. So if you can actually improve the disease environment and reduce reinfection within a pretty short amount of time, people's health improves because the worms in their body die off and every worm in your intestine is the product of a separate infection event. They're not reproducing inside of, of the intestine. Uh, and so that was something that we got interested in early on uh, in this project because worms are an infectious disease the spillovers of treatment could be very important. If I'm no longer getting reinfected, the worms in my body will die off, I'll become healthy. So other people's treatment choices could directly affect me. And in, in the earlier work, that was like a central methodological focus of the, of the work. Um, okay, so uh, the WHO has long recommended mass treatment for worms if there's even a minimum level of prevalence of around 20%. The reason why is screening is kind of expensive. You have to collect stool samples and take them to labs. Um, but the drugs are cheap and have very minimal side effects. So the idea is if there's even minimal prevalence, there should be mass treatment. And, um, you know, there's been some debate about the, the magnitude of the benefits of, of mass treatment, all the kind of latest meta-analyses, as long as you restrict attention to settings with at least 20% prevalence show pretty large nutritional gains. Some of the earlier reviews like the Taylor Robinson included a bunch of data from settings with say 4%, you know, or 5% prevalence. And of course, if there's no worms, there's no benefit of deworming. As, as would make sense. There's also some US historical evidence. Uh, as recently as 19, the 19 teens in the US South, hookworm infection rates were 40 to 50% in that region of the country. And the Rockefeller Foundation's first big program was deworming the US South. And there's been a debate among economic historians about what the benefits were about that deworming with some showing some larger benefits, the Rudman more recent take uh, more muted benefits. Okay, so what I'll talk about today is, is a long run follow up of a deworming program, a mass deworming program that was designed to follow the WHO mass treatment recommendations that started in Kenya in 1998. We worked in 75 uh, primary schools. Each primary school had about 400 something kids. There were around 30,000 kids in the uh, baseline sample. Primary schools in Kenya went from like pre K, K up to grade eight at that time, so a pretty wide uh, age range. And what was novel at the time is that the treatment was phased in experimentally. Again, in one of the first uh, experiments in, in um, development um, economics. Uh, in terms of the setting, this is actually just a photo of a, a public health nurse distributing uh, deworming pills to kids. Again, the, the pills are cheap. You only need to take the pills once or twice a year to kill the worms off in, in your body, um, which makes it very cost effective. You know, it's only about 50 cents per child uh, per year to, to treat. And this setting was one with very high worm infections. So at the time, the baseline, January 1998, over 90% of kids in, Ken in these Kenyan primary schools had at least one worm infection. It was 93%. Uh, most had multiple infections. Many had what the WHO would consider moderate to heavy infections. So based on the stool sample uh, analysis. And so those are infections that could lead to significant nutritional uh, consequences. Did you say we're just about ethics and not treating everybody because we know everybody's infected. Everybody. Yeah, so um, the NGO that we work with at this time started before we worked with them working in seven schools and they were planning to scale up over time. And what we discussed with them and got approval from the Kenyan government and IRB here was as they phased up to randomize the order of the phase. So actually all the schools eventually got brought in. Um, they first expanded to 25, then 50, then 75 schools. Then they expanded to more schools uh, in the region. So we went through ethical review and 
The, there were some issues though about knowing who was treated or not, which was the Kenyan uh, ethics uh, board um, said any kid who is uh, where we collect stool samples and we know they're infected need to be treated as part of the program. That was one of the ethical requirements. The um, parasitological surveys only took place in a random subset of kids just before treatment in certain areas. So when we went into certain areas, those tests were done and then there was mass treatment. Yeah, there was mass treatment, yeah, of everybody. So those were you know, obviously important um, uh, concerns. There were also some issues around, and this is getting maybe too much into the weeds, but at the time the WHO actually did not recommend that teenage girls get treated because there were risks of some sort of, uh, you know, risk to the fetus if she might be pregnant. Those uh, rules were, you know, sort of uh, eliminated by the WHO afterwards. We followed those rules and the Kenyan government recommendation on that. Um, one reason, there's a bunch of reasons why infection rates were so high. One is there were just a lot of worm infections at this time in East Africa. But the second one was this is in the middle of a pretty bad El Nino Southern Oscillation uh, year. There was a lot of flooding uh, in the area, which really did not help the hygiene and sanitation uh, environment. And so that probably contributed to like particularly high rates of infection. So this is a setting where basically all the kids have worm infections uh, at baseline. So for folks thinking in like an instrumental variables framework about like treatment effects on the treated, like everybody's infected. Like effectively our intention to treat is the TOT uh, here. Um, this is, I just put this up because everybody laughs, you know, when they see this, but this was a grad student who worked very hard on this project. Along yeah. the um, but you, the reason I put it up here really, other than the laughs, is this is just farmland, but this gives you a sense of how flooded it was. So this is like supposed to be people's like maize fields, but it was flooded. Latrines were flooding at the time as well, uh, as I remember vividly. So it wasn't a great hygiene and sanitation environment. Because roads were also flooded, this is actually a road area. We were like going to the initial schools on canoes and sort of paddling to schools to do data collection. Um, so I also show this when any, ever anybody complains about field work conditions. Um, but uh, it, was, it was kind of difficult and, and definitely the disease environment wasn't great that year. I'm, I'm mentioning that partially, um, you know, just for full you know, context, but also when we think about external validity, this is a setting with like really bad worm infections. Um, compared to many others. Okay, so um, we worked with an NGO to design this, this program. We worked with the government of Kenya who provided uh, public health um, nurses to provide treatment. Um, <clears throat> after stratification, there was a list randomization where the 75 schools were put in a spreadsheet and we counted down the list to divide them into three treatment groups, one, two, and three. So there were you know 25 group one, 25 group two, 25 Group three, the reason we did not use a random number of generators, we wanted to be able to be transparent to local government officials about how the allocation of schools even occurred. Randomization was a new thing. Uh, in this case, the NGO hadn't done it before. It was like a, a new approach. And we wanted to be able to explain what we did rather than saying it came out of a random number generator, whatever that was, if we were talking to a local education official. Group one schools got phased into drugs and health education 98. Group two, the next year, group three, uh, a couple years uh, later. I'm not gonna talk about it today for reasons of time, but starting in 2001, there was a cross-cutting experiment that um, varied, all of this was free treatment, but starting in 2001, some schools were asked to pay for deworming drugs because the NGO wanted to introduce cost recovery. We were like opposed to it at the time, um, but we did convince them to, again, randomize uh, cost recovery so we could understand the demand for deworming drugs. Um, I'm not gonna focus on it today. It turns out when you do charge for something, people, not everybody pays for it. There's a downward sloping demand curve. Uh, and so there's much less take up in those schools. So I'll talk a little bit about this later on because we use some of that variation uh, in some of the analysis. Okay, so I'll just quickly go through this for reasons of time, but this is like a consort style diagram. We have our baseline sample. Schools are divided into these three groups. <clears throat> the main distinction I'm going to make in the analysis today is I'm going to compare these group one and two schools that got phased in in either 98 or 99 to the group three schools that got phased in 2001. So on average, they got about two and a half more years of deworming than group three. And that's like the main variation in deworming treatment. But in some of the analysis, I'll use all the variation between group one and group two, because group one got an extra year, between the schools that had to pay for drugs in, in one year or not, because that also induces changes in take up. And we'll you know, kind of look at the full range of variation, but for simplicity, we'll mainly compare 
what we call treatment, group one and two, versus control, group three. All right, so what do we find? And what I wanna do over the next 10 minutes is just give you, because we've been working on this for a long time, a little bit of a survey of a, the results of the first few papers and then spend the last 20 or so minutes on the child mortality results. In the, the first published paper, we found the drugs were effective. They reduced um, serious infections, moderate to heavy infections a lot. There were gains in some health measures. And the two kind of main findings of the first paper that got a lot of attention was in the deworming treatment schools, kids started going to school more. So remember, they all have worm infections, some of them very seriously. It looks like worm related morbidity was preventing some of them from going to school. When they were treated, they went to school more. So that was one finding. The other one was we designed the project as a cluster randomized trial so we could look at spillover effects between different schools. So if I'm in a group three school, but I happen to be located near a group one school, there could be spillover benefits because a lot of kids maybe a kilometer away from me were getting treated. And we actually find that. We find that if you're within about four kilometers of a treatment school, worm infection rates in other schools fall. So it actually turns out if we only did the simplest treatment versus control comparison, we would miss out on a lot of the benefits of treatment because they're spilling over more generally. And we developed a pretty simple approach, but one that's been adopted by a lot of other scholars to study spillovers in, in the social sciences. Um, okay. Now, do you think we could um, just preview like... How oh, there you are. I didn't see you. You know, like, <laughs> oh, yeah. this work for the pioneers yeah. of work for Sola. I just wondered if you could share with the audience how the early results and how their reception actually changed practice on the ground, given that we're now 20 years later and you've been continually you know, making impact. But I just wanted the translation of the research to policy and practice, if you could just give a little element of that, because I feel like we need to be inspired by that too. Awesome. I have a slide. I, I added one last night because I was thinking, uh, so I'll, I'll get to the, the, the point on policy in a few, sli in, in a few slides because it is part of the story that I think is, is a little different than some other studies. In terms of like on the scholarly side, in terms of the research methods, I do think that um, the, this early study, again, because it was one of the first uh, experiments in development economics, did inspire follow-on work. Uh, and certainly the, you know, the main reason now this paper is cited is because of the spillover, the, st the, the methodology to study spillovers, which has been applied in all different areas. And so yeah. we're not econometricians, either Michael or I, but we followed like a very intuitive approach yeah. that relied on the random variation. And it's turned out, to, I think, to be pretty robust. Yeah. Um, so I think we've influenced both the, you know, the experimental approach and the study of spillovers in, in the social sciences. Yeah. yeah. I might have this later on. So I know that from many of the nutrition interventions, you can improve height, but changing stunting seems to be much harder. Did you find any effect on actual stunting like measures? We did it and we found some initial kind of height results, but not very robust and not very large. So we found gains in some other dimensions of health, but not as much on height. Now, the age range again in primary school isn't the like the very youngest kids, and some we might think that some of those growth uh, effects would be larger among the youngest kids, but no, we didn't find like very robust growth effects. Yeah. All right. So shortly after I got to Berkeley, you know, and when we had written up that first study, we started following up a, a random, a representative subset of kids in the initial study. So we picked 7,500, so about a quarter of the baseline. A sample, we focused on grades two to seven, just have a little more compact age range. You know, kids in grade eight would often repeat grade eight at that time in Kenya. And so we had like this long right tail of ages. Um, and we didn't want to work with the very youngest kids, maybe for, you know, some data collection difficulty. So we focused on this compact uh, age range with the goal of saying, hey, we found these short run gains in education and health. What happens to these kids' lives over the next, you know, five or 10 years, we thought at the time. What we decided to do, you know, which was a little unusual at the time, is we put a lot of effort into tracking people wherever they moved. And we were very fortunate to get funding, mainly from NIH, but some other donors, to have the resources to do that. And so uh, it turns out to be very important because, like, by now, 20 something years later, the majority of people live outside the original study area. Like, if we only stuck to people who lived in their home village, we wouldn't find uh, too many people. Um, having cell phones has turned out to be critical. Like the fact that cell phones like took off right at the time we started this project uh, enabled a lot of what we do. Uh, we do a, um, 
we compute what's called the effective tracking rate, which is similar to what folks in US studies like Moving to Opportunity and others have used with a kind of two-phase tracking design. The effective tracking uh, rate uh, in each of the four rounds we've carried out has been around 84%. So that means we you know, really are collecting data on the bulk of the sample. Uh, and we've like found at least once in a follow-up, 87% of the sample. So it's not perfect and it's not 99%, but we've managed to keep collecting data on really the bulk of the sample over, over a couple decades. Uh, and again, not quite as good as the Indonesia Family Life Survey, but a rate that we, we put a lot of work into. And again, just finding people, as anybody who's worked on KLPS knows, is a huge, uh, huge effort. So this is just a map of where people lived in the most recent round. So this was the round collected between uh, 2017 and 2021, Busia district in Western Kenya is where the project started, less than half the sample is still there. A lot of people are in Nairobi or Mombasa. Um, some people moved to Uganda, which is right on the border, and there's very strong kind of family and ethnic and linguistic ties across the border. Um, and then people kind of scatter around the rest of Kenya. There's also some people living in, in other countries at this time. There has been a bit of a change. We're now in the fifth round of data collection. And just in the last few years, relatively large numbers of Kenyans have started to move to Gulf countries. Um, and so we're starting to do some phone surveys to people there because we can't physically travel there. But within East Africa, we send enumerators to Uganda, all over Kenya, occasionally to Tanzania, but when they're even farther away, it becomes, um, it becomes harder. So again, this is the continuation of the concert diagram. You know, we did data collection round one in 2003 to five, round two, uh, round three, round four, uh, they, you know, they're getting older, of course, in each round. Now in 2023, we started the next round and the age range is more like 35 to low 40s. Um, so they're getting, they're in midlife now, um, but I'll, I'll report data through KLPS4 when they were basically in their 30s, early to mid, uh, early to mid 30s. There were some smaller cross-cutting experiments in subsets of the sample that I'm not going to get into today. The treatment groups from those experiments are excluded from the later rounds, but because those were randomized, we still have valid inference on the remainder of the, of the sample, although we lose a little bit of sample size. All right, so let me just review some more of the, of the findings and then get into the more uh, recent results. Um, we have two papers, one in published in 2016 and then one in 2021 that look at labor market outcomes. Now that these folks were adults in KLPS 2, 3, and 4, we can measure what happens to them. Uh, in the labor market, and we basically find pretty consistent gains in earnings um, and uh, longer work hours, as, as well as shifts in the sector of employment, which I'll get to in the next uh, next slide. There are some differences by gender. There were some differences in the Navy. There, there are really big differences in the occupations people go into by gender uh, in Kenya, as is also the case in other, other societies. So for instance, we see a, 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 a significant rise in manufacturing jobs for males in the treatment group, uh, but different types of work uh, for females in the treatment group. But there are labor market impacts um, uh, overall. And yeah, so this, is yeah. about, um, this is the causal effect of the dewarming treatment. But are you thinking of this mostly as kind of the direct health effect or mostly as that initial uh, attendance of school effect? Or it's such a great question. It's one we've struggled with in all the, these papers, and even with the child mortality paper we struggle with, which is it's hard to decompose those effects. There, there's a direct health effect, potentially. There's the education effect. There's the fact that my peers are different. Like I'm in a treatment school where everybody else is a little healthier. Everybody else is getting a little more education. So my social network uh, has changed and so on. So um, what we're going to do for child mortality is I'm going to show you a range of potential channels for that outcome. And there's gonna be some suggestive evidence about which may be most important, but it's very difficult to do a credible mediation style analysis when we have the one instrument of deworming treatment that, that we've shown has affected a lot of things. So it's it's a sort of thing that we're often gonna struggle with. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, so on the labor market effect, yeah. and maybe this relates to what you're gonna to present today too, yeah. how should we be thinking about kind of the, you know, um, the alternative in terms of like, are these jobs that the control group would have had or are these jobs that like nobody could have done except for the intervention? So kind of thinking about like, are they taking just other people's jobs or the, you know, kind of trying to make a little bit of Yeah, it's, it's a great question thinking about displacement or what the social kind of benefits are. You know, when we're thinking about the Kenyan labor market as a whole and this intervention, as large as it was in Western Kenya, is kind of a drop in the bucket relative to the population as a whole, you know, 
the effects we're estimating may be different than the GE effects. Like the GE effects when this is rolled out nationally could be, could be different. Um, so, and it's a little hard for us to get a handle on that. You might think with a more educated workforce, there could be greater investment, greater capital investment. And um, so, you know, maybe we'd understate the GE effects, right? Or maybe we'd overstate them because what we're estimating is displacement. So we don't take a strong stand on that, but I think those are issues, again, we've grappled with. Really interesting issues. Uh, okay, uh, we also document in the longer term some health and education gains, self-reported health is better. Women report experiencing fewer miscarriages, which would relate to their nutritional status and health. Um, there's an increase in the total school enrollment, gains in test scores. Uh, and it's pretty interesting, human capital gains in terms of test score gains, we actually administer short tests to them in the survey. In terms of secondary school enrollment are actually larger among females uh, than males in the sample. But as I'll show you on the next slide, the 20 year labor market gains are somewhat larger among males. And again, that may have to do with differences in labor market opportunities and discrimination uh, by gender, uh, but basically there are gains in different dimensions for different um, uh, gender groups. Very large gains in education though for females. So a big increase in secondary school enrollment uh, in the treatment group. Okay, so in the more recent rounds, we you know continue tracking them 20 years on. We started registering pre-analysis plans for all of our analysis as that spread. And that was part of the whole BITS, you know, open science uh, push, uh, including the results I'll, I'll present today on child mortality. We expanded our measure of living standards. So we actually administered a full consumption expenditure module in KLPS4. Again, that's a mouthful, but it's very hard to measure living standards in low and middle income settings because people don't have a paycheck. Usually you have to measure their agricultural productivity, including subsistence agriculture, informal employment, informal profits. But we do that uh, here. So some of the, the living standards measures I'll talk about now do that. We have uh, greater coverage of completed fertility histories and child survival, which we'll draw on today, where we base it on the DHS surveys that I think people are familiar with. Um, and just in general, added a lot more information on child outcomes. So we were funded by NICHD and have just collected a lot of detailed information on child, not just survival and health, but behavior, cognitive outcomes, parental investments. And I'm only gonna to just touch on the mortality side today, but there's a bunch of other work that, that some of us are working on for, for other outcomes. All right, so what, you know, what does uh, respondent you know, tracking look like over time? Again, overall, we've surveyed about 87% per of people at least one time. And the difference between treatment and control is pretty close to zero. So we don't have differential follow-up. It's basically the same for both. And just in the most recent round, KLPS4, Again, we surveyed 87% of people overall with the effective tracking weight, which is kind of reweights observations, same in treatment control. So that kind of basic concern about imbalance across treatment arms isn't as much of an issue for us here, which is nice mm -hmm. um, from the design point of view and really a testament to the, the field work. We run a very standard specification where we look at outcomes and I'll focus on mainland child mortality on the main treatment indicator variable. So we're really focused on lambda one. There's also this cost sharing experiment cross-cutting that I talked about. In general, in previous work, we find the signs of lambda one and lambda two are almost always opposite, which is good because lambda, one, you know, treatment means more deworming, cost sharing means you were getting less deworming. So that, you know, uh, made sense. We control for design factors, things, you know, X's, covariates involved in sampling. We also include some time effects, but this is basically regressing an outcome on the treatment dummy with, you know, some, some standard uh, adjustments. We also pre-specified in the pre-analysis plan, we look at things by gender and age. So we didn't pre-specify too much heterogeneity. Those were the key demographic um, dimensions. Okay, so what did we find with the 20-year living standards follow-up? We find gains in consumption and earnings 20 years later of around 10%, plus or minus. Um, and even the consumption expenditure measure from the living standards measurement survey shows a gain of, um, this is a gain of about 14% in consumption. So a lot. Um, individual earnings are up by about 13%. Again, with larger labor market gains for males and some human, larger human capital gains for, for females. Another really interesting point is, especially in the most recent rounds as people got older, migration to urban areas is very high and it's significantly higher for the kids who got the health investment when they were younger. So it's about 10% higher. And moving to a city is a really big deal. Uh, Nairobi is a big modern city with millions of people and very different types of jobs than you would ever be able to find in uh, in rural areas. So I put a picture here just because people may not, you know, appreciate you know the scale of it. But there's significantly more people moving to uh, large urban areas uh, as well. 
let me just skip over the slide because I, I mentioned these results and I'm, I'm uh, short on time. And I want to get to Rucker's question about the policy response just for a couple of minutes. So throughout this process, I think we um, were lucky to have good relationships with folks in the Kenyan government from the beginning. We had relationships with people in the Ministry of Health. Uh, later on, Ministry of Education as well. Those, those links were stronger. Um, and we presented the results widely. We shared them widely. And the Kenyan government became quite interested in this program, partially, I think, because it was so cost effective. Again, it's 50 cents per kid per year. And there are these measurable benefits. It was seen as kind of politically not that controversial uh, to do. And the, the combination of government interest and some donors, international donors, uh, they got together and started funding national deworming in 2009 in Kenya with millions of kids uh, receiving treatment. And that has continued uh, since then. There was a bit of a break during COVID with fewer kids treated for one year, but pretty much since 2009, there's been mass deworming in elementary schools across Kenya. They've even expanded to treat uh, adults. So last year, I think it was 5 million kids uh, were, were treated. While the government has been carrying out this, this program with some donor support, they've also been doing some surveillance of worm infection rates. So the worm infection rates in Western Kenya and Busia, which were 90% when we started, in the most recent survey last year, were less than 10%. So this like decade of mass treatment has like kind of knocked out worm infections in Kenya. Nationally, they're like 5% uh, worm infections. At the start, they were more like 40% nationally. So it's just been an incredible, you know, again, it didn't happen in one year, but a decade of consistent public health policy made uh, a big effort. And it's been very exciting for us because along the way, we're called on to provide data and speak to government officials and donors to sort of provide, you know, the latest evidence. Um, the same donors that funded the Kenyan project got really excited about expanding it. So they ended up funding large scale programs in India, Nigeria, Pakistan, and Vietnam. And so the last, again, five or six years, they've been treating hundreds of millions of kids uh, a year, and they've distributed uh, 1.8 billion treatments in the last decade. So in India, for instance, in regions of India that had 30% prevalence, 20%, 40% prevalence, a decade ago, in the most recent surveys, there was like two or 3% prevalence. Like, like the mass treatment programs are just really, uh, really effective. There's still some East African countries that don't have mass treatment programs. The government of Tanzania is now interested, and they're trying to find donors to fund, fund this. Uh, but again, as a researcher, it's been a really interesting thing to be a part of because, you know, depending on, uh, you know, if you get good fortune and people are interested in your research, it may get more or less attention. This is one where policymakers were really interested in, uh, in the findings. Uh, okay, so effects on the next generation. So I have maybe like 10, 12 minutes uh, before questions. Um, through the most recent survey round in KLPS4, the average respondent had had about three children. So that's much lower fertility than the previous generation of Kenyans who had some of the highest fertility rates in the world. Um, they had around three kids. And the question is, what happens to these children's outcomes if their parent happened to get the investment in school health rather than, uh, you know, compared to the control group? We already said the parents gain in a variety of ways and it's plausible those could affect child outcomes, living in a city, having more education, being richer, all those things. The main new finding is we actually find that under five mortality falls in, among children in the deworming treatment group by about a fifth. Uh, and that's statistically significant. So this is just the data, presenting you the raw data that the analysis is based on. This is the year of childbirth. And these are the children of our initial respondents, right? Mm -hmm. So this was the period, the initial period of the treatment program. There weren't very many births actually here because they were at the oldest teenagers, but there were a few teen uh, you know, pregnancies here. Uh, but over time, the number of births increase. And we go all the way out to birth in 2016 because we're looking at under five mortality. So we want to think at that full five-year period out to 2021. The gray thin line is the Kenyan national average for under five mortality. And you can see it fell from about 100 to 50 over this period, over about 20 years. So a real improvement in under five mortality in, uh, in Kenya. The blue line here is the control group, and it pretty much traces a not dissimilar path downwards. So we're seeing this improvement in our sample as well in terms of under five mortality uh, falling. The orange line is the, are the children in the treatment group. And of course, they bounce around. There's different samples in each year. There's sampling variation. But in general, the orange line is below the blue line. And when you regress child uh, mortality on the treatment indicator and those other you know, co school level covariates, et cetera, we find a reduction of 17 deaths per thousand births 
um, on a base of 76 deaths per thousand over this time period. Yeah. Just to clarify, <clears throat> these effects estimates, I should have asked this earlier, these effects estimates are the effect of having the treatment two years prior to the control. Is that right? And first is the effects of having the treatment versus no treatment. Exactly. These are the effects of getting phased into the program two to three years before the control. But let me say one, one thing there, which is for the kids in the older grades, very often they graduated before their school got phased in. So for some of the kids in the older grades, it's the difference between like three and zero effectively, or four and one. For the kids in the younger grades, it could be the difference between five years and two years of deworming or six years and three years of deworming. But yes, it's, it's two to three additional years of deworming in childhood. Um, so, so when you talk to, let's say, a country policymakers who have, don't have this, and, and the question for them is deworming versus no deworming. Mm -hmm. What's the estimated yeah. effect of that gap? Based on, can you estimate it from your data? Yeah, I, I think with our data, the best we could do is, is try to look at those older cohorts of something versus nothing. But I think most of the policymakers have looked at this and said, because the control group eventually gets phased in, it's reasonable to think of these as lower bounds on the effects of like, you know, five or six years of deworming versus zero. So five or six versus two is probably a smaller difference than five or six versus zero. And that's kind of how the, do you know, the, the donors supporting this have also been framing this. It's like in some ways these are conservative. Estimates and they're and they're pretty large. Um, so, but I think that's that's a that's an important question and it really a result of the design, the phase in the step wedge design. Um, so maybe I only have a couple more minutes. So let me just quickly go through the last few findings. This is the regression that I just showed. This is the sort of regression form of what I just showed you. This is the treatment uh, indicator, the base of seventy six per uh, thousand, a drop of seventeen. If we look at female parents and male parents, obviously the samples are smaller. But the point estimates are kind of the same. Um, we can't, re we clearly can't reject they're the same. They're almost identical. Um, so that's that's pretty interesting. There were different deworming did different things to the to the male and female recipients. Males having larger gains in income, females in human capital. But somehow the combined effect of those benefits seems to sort of yield the same uh, the same gain. I'm not showing it here, but we also looked at female kids and male kids, and again can't reject the same effect. So we pre-specify gender as a very important dimension of heterogeneity, but it doesn't come through for parents and kids here. There's kind of very consistent effects. If we look just at under one mortality, that's about half of the under five mortality, we still see negative point estimates, pretty large magnitudes, a 15% drop, but not statistically significant here. So if that's the variable uh, one cared about, there'd be kind of less clear, uh, less clear evidence uh, there. Uh, but under five uh, is, is a bit stronger statistically. Yeah. Sorry. Maybe I missed this. Did you say yeah. that? Did you look for differences in fertility between the groups? We did. I'm, I'm not emphasizing it too much here. There's no significant difference in fertility. If you look at total fertility completed through KLPS4, there's a slight difference in the timing of fertility. In the control group, people have children on average a fraction, like uh, two months earlier on average than the treatment group. Um, some of those differences are marginally significant, but total fertility we can't reject equality. So we thought that was that was pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. If anything, again, in the treatment group, people have kids a little later and maybe have a you know 0 0.1 of a kid mm -hmm. less over time, but it's not statistically meaningful, that difference. So we, we thought that could be could be important potentially. In terms of mechanisms for the sort of similar impacts between female parents and male parents, I'm curious if you have any information on the spouses of these folks and whether or not getting access to treatment and what that meant for their life trajectory means yeah. that they were marrying folks who also had yeah. better trajectory. We've been debating, um, we have written this up in, as a self-contained paper. We have another paper we're working on that's just focusing on spousal characteristics. There are differences in spousal characteristics. Um, there's a bunch of pretty interesting differences in marital outcomes for females in the sample. Um, and maybe in a year or two, there'll be another brown bag where <laughs> another team member can present those. So we de-emphasize, we have a footnote saying, this could be really important. We're studying that separately. Um, so stay tuned for that. Okay, let's give Ted about four more minutes without questions and then we'll be- Cool, okay. I'm gonna zoom a little bit. Um, just going back to the original sample, if we take those estimates of the reduction under five mortality back to our original 30,000 kids in the sample and we compare group one and two to group three, just exactly the comparison I showed you and knowing how many, you know, People on average have three children. It suggests there were a thousand fewer under five deaths just in this sub region of Busia district 
due to the deworming program. So quite a substantial you know, impact of the, of the program. Um, and definitely something we're, you know, we were excited to, to kind of work through. So let me just um, go, go quite quickly. I mentioned already, and this was to Claude's question, this issue of the phase in, and there's sort of like different comparisons we're making. So if we use all the variation in the data, including the fact that some people age out of school before they get any deworming, the cost sharing variation, et cetera, um, we really have variation from zero years of free deworming up to six in this time period. And one of the things that we were kind of reassured by is whether we look at uh, mortality effects or consumption effects, living standards effects, they're monotonically increasing with the amount of deworming you get. So that kind of gives us some more confidence that all that variation sort of going in the same direction. The other thing that's kind of interesting is once you get to around three or four years of deworming, additional deworming doesn't seem to have as big an effect as those first three or four years. So there could be some concavity or kind of leveling off of benefit, which again, you know, could be a reason why getting three, you know, three years versus zero may be a bigger deal than six versus three, exactly to the intuition of your your point. So let me kind of move on here. And as I was mentioning to Dennis, there are these kind of fertility effects of a fraction of a birth, but they're kind of marginally significant and not huge. Um, so, um, okay, let me let me just keep moving forward. Talking about mechanisms is tricky. A lot of things are going on. We don't really do a serious mediation analysis here because we feel like the assumptions are very strong in this context to make them work. But we do you know, posit that deworming could affect lots of things and those same things could affect child mortality. So this figure is our attempt to convey this in a compact way. So here were five classes of explanations that we found in a, in a lit review were very common in explaining child mortality in low and middle income country settings, parental health, parental education, living standards and residence, fertility patterns, access to healthcare. We have all these measures in our detailed surveys and it turns out all of them correlate negatively with mortality exactly as you'd expect. More educated people have fewer of their kids die. People who live in cities, fewer of their kids die. Um, people who have institutional deliveries, fewer of their kids die. All those correlations go in the expected direction. This panel shows the correlation or the impact of deworming on each of those channels. Deworming improves each of these things, sometimes to a small degree, sometimes to a large degree. But basically all the hypothesized mechanisms seem to be improved at least weekly by deworming. And in our data, they're all associated with less child mortality. So we don't know exactly you know, how to decompose these. And they also interrelate in complex ways. Like living in a city may actually give me better access to healthcare. So is it the city effect or is it the healthcare effect? Same thing with my education. Um, so we leave it at this and saying, it looks like there could be multiple channels that are contributing to this large effect and deworming is sort of pushing on a lot of margins. People did mention gender. And so one thing I'll just mention briefly is on a bunch of the human capital effects, health and education, the, the triangle here is females. There are larger effects for females than males. But for some of the earnings and urban residence effects, the squares are males, there are larger effects for males. Somehow the overall effect is very similar, but the, the channels could be different actually for male and females who got a child health investment. Okay, let me just uh, wrap up in, in another couple slides with Maddie, Michael and others who are here. We have some other work, another paper we're working on looking not at health, but at cognitive outcomes of kids of the deworming treatment group, deworming control group that finds some substantial gains in child um, cognitive outcomes during the pre-COVID period. We collected data in the pre-COVID period and then right after lockdowns ended, in general, schooling outcomes and learning outcomes really deteriorated in our data right after COVID lockdowns. I think maybe everybody's familiar with, with those data and there weren't deworming treatment effects in that period, but in the kind of normal period there were. So we're still investigating that, but it's pretty, um, pretty interesting. Um, and then just to wrap up, I, I'll, I'll just show uh, a figure to, to, to wrap up, we're able to do some cost benefit type analysis, looking at the, the cost of deworming and the benefits. Um, we had done this previously for earnings in a previous paper and showed the earnings gains are much larger than the deworming cost. Of course, if something's 50 cents per year, any earnings gain is like a pretty high return. Maybe not too surprisingly. We did the same thing with health gains, valuing survival, which is always kind of a terrible activity, but there is all the work on disability adjusted life years and attempts to kind of use some money metric to, to value health and survival gains. And regardless of the assumptions we make, we just get very high returns purely on child survival alone, intergenerationally from deworming. 
So again, the point is it's a very cheap intervention, seems to have a lot of benefits. So just to wrap up, we found you know, a child health investment benefited the recipients and their children. Um, this could change cost benefit analysis. I think we've been very lucky to have stable partnerships, stable funding from NIH and other partners, stable partnerships with Kenyan government partners, NGO partners. So we're very grateful for that. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to do this work without that. Uh, our goal, just to give the big picture, we're working on a broader expansion of KLPS in the coming years. We're working with Will and others uh, on this. We, we want to keep this going and create the first 50-year panel data set in an uh, African setting that we know of. We've started focusing a lot more on aging issues as our samples now in, in, in midlife. We're actually putting in place a midlife baseline on health and cognition, which we'll use to then understand changes over time. Again, with, with Will's expertise and others uh, on board, if you're interested in this data, um, all the existing rounds, uh, the deworming data, rounds one, two, and three, and some of round four, we're finishing the uh, make publishing round four, are freely available on Harvard Dataverse. Please use the data. Um, and you know maybe in the future, not only will we study long-run aging, but we'll actually be able to answer the question I motivated this with, which is, does improving the health of one generation break the transmission of poverty to the next generation? But we may need to wait another 10 or 15 years until uh, we see that. Doors open. Well, I just have a question about politics and ethnicity in Kenya. Was there any effect that you could tell of which government was in power and which, I don't know what ethnicity the region around Busia mainly is, but. That's a great question. Um, the region where we work is predominantly ethnically Luya. Yeah. And the Luyas have been kind of frozen out of the highest levels of power, which maybe was good yeah. on some level. Um, and so there have been, since 2009, two different major government transitions in that period, and, and the program has continued. So I think it's a program that's it's kind of seen in technocratic terms and hasn't been too associated with any one figure. Again, we were very lucky that in the early days, the Ministry of Health, Education, others kind of all got on board and somehow reached consensus. This was an easy thing to do that could have, have benefits, and it's continued. So again, we feel really lucky that that's been the case. Yeah. If Alicia had a question, is it to, to read or is it for the side? Um... Yeah, and Alicia has a question about reaching out to Penn in general. She has a problem. And I, I have a quick comment, which is just th thank you. The, the possible pathway, you said that there was a slight effect or association with um, delayed childbearing. Yeah. And just to, you may have figured this out already, um, but from our evidence in northern Nigeria and Niger, um, the, the, the impact on the education, the fact that they were attending school more often, um, may mean that they then perform better at school, that they stayed later, longer in school and were likely to bear children later. And, and then my yeah. question yeah. is just, I'm looking to meet uh, doctoral students at Berkeley who um, could assist us with an RCT that we're planning in, in Northern Nigeria and another one in Niger. I mean, that's, that, that, sounds, that sounds great. And I think your, your point uh, makes a lot of sense in that there is this sort of slight delay in age at first birth both for males and females, as it turns out. And again, people are in school kind of a fraction of a year, a year more, Alicia. So I think it does kind of line up with maybe everything just got pushed out, uh, you know, for some people. Um, um, Will and Dennis, raise your hand if you if you want me to call on you. Okay, we'll get Rucker, and then we'll probably have to stop. Okay. Thank you. This is a, I, I learn every time I hear you present something about this. So this is fabulous, but you've been continuing to push forward. I want to go back to mechanisms uh, and you know thinking about the the child mortality in particular. And instead of thinking about the sort of proximate mechanisms of of the, the adult parents, I want to think back when they were kids. So what are the mechanisms? There was this sort of three year differential. And if you take seriously the fact that you don't see differences by uh, boys versus girls at the time of treatment, that would suggest it's not primarily a a physiological improvement in the health of the you know, you know, would-be mothers. Um, if you think about the schooling attainment, I, I understand that the statistically estimating mediation is hard, but you can you know, think about bounds of plausible estimates based on the literature out there. And it's hard to believe that schooling attainment of you know, the relatively modest attainment size right. 
could have anywhere near a 20% impact on, on child mortality. Yeah. So there's there's test score effects. It's hard to get a comparable literature, but, and then you yeah. you mentioned the potentially cohort effects, but yeah. what, what, what do you think could possibly be going on that could explain something yeah. this big, thinking back to that immediate mechanism in those you know, three yeah. years? Yeah, I mean, I, what we haven't done is we haven't taken existing estimates from the literature and kind of combined them with these treatment effects. We've done, you know, we did this kind of analysis, okay, within our data, what's, what's the correlation? But if we were to say, you know, the return to a year of schooling is 10 or 12%, or maybe 15% best case, then a third of a year is a 5% increase in earnings. And, but again, you know, we are finding a 10% increase in earnings or consumption. So maybe that does explain a decent share of that, um, you know, that effect. Uh, in terms of the, the, the child mortality effects, um, yeah, we haven't done that exercise beyond what I'm showing you here. So I'm not you know, entirely sure. I, I do wonder if we underappreciate the magnitude of certain effects. So for instance, like the, the cohort effect or the, the peer effects, one of the things we report in the 2021 paper is people in the deworming treatment group are way more likely to report that a friend from their school, because we asked that question, helped them get a job. And so you know, once you say like, I'm healthier, I'm learning more, I'm going to school more, but so are my friends. So I get an even better job. Like, then things could start, you know, getting larger than we would think from like a very simple additive, um, you know, mediation approach. But we haven't um, gone fully in or, you know, kind of dove in fully, um, but maybe referees will <laughs> push us to do that more. And I'd like to talk to you more about it if you have thoughts with concrete ways for it. Okay, we're coming to an end. Let's hear both questions and then we'll give uh, Ed the chance to choose which one he wants to answer first. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, you don't have, I, I, was, I was interested in the finding that people um, won't pay so little for something that has such huge yeah. impacts, and I it made me curious how people understand these findings. In you know, is there is it covered in the media that people do people see themselves that this has happened? So that was I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I guess maybe if you could put in perspective the generational impacts on cognitive um, achievement for the next generation, like those magnitudes and like what ages were the the, the kids? I just didn't. You said yeah, I, I went super fast. Yeah. Let me let me start with this and I'll get back to, to this point. So we were collecting data in the, in the previous round between kids three to eight years old. So there were some kids kind of before primary school, some in early primary school. And in the kind of normal period where kids were going to school, the deworming treatment effect was about 0.33 standard deviation units, which is meaningful. And on average, the difference in, in a common test score across grades is about one standard deviation in primary schools in Kenya. So that'd be like 30% of a year or a third of a year, mm -hmm. something like that. So pretty, pretty substantial gains there. Um, you know, back to Will's point on decompositions, one of the things we found in some other data is conditional on everything else we can measure, kids born in urban areas actually do better on cognitive tests. So I do wonder if that could be part of the channel. So it's like, yeah, parents, human capital and whatnot, but being in an urban environment, you know, there's just different amenities, maybe different quality of stimulation and stuff. So I think, I think it's pretty meaningful um, and we're still exploring that. Maddie, you know, working with Maddie on that. Uh, on the point on take up, we have a whole nother paper trying to understand take up. And uh, I think in the very short run when cost sharing was, was implemented, um, yeah, it's not clear. There, there were, you know, in general positive views of deworming but it's not clear people fully appreciated these benefits. Of course, it was only the short run so they couldn't have. Um, the other thing there is we, we make a public goods type argument, which is a lot of the benefits in our own analysis of deworming came from spillovers from other people. So conditional on everybody else taking it, my private benefits are not as large as this overall estimate. Uh, and so that gap between private and social benefits could have led to some free riding, especially if there's some, you know, there's some minimal side effects. So I'd be like, oh, let me avoid the, the side effects and the payment and free ride on my neighbor. So we make that argument, um, but it was a little bit speculative, I would say. Okay, let's thank Ted's regular here on Wednesdays and also on other